St. John chapter number one. And Myrtle, what about Linda? She did okay? She all right? Okay. I'm going to read 18 verses, so if that will be a problem for you, uh, don't feel guilty about not standing with us. St. John chapter number one and uh, the first 18 verses. All right, the scripture says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of His fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, no man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. You may be seated. I don't know that I can do these 18 verses any justice today, or the right kind of justice. We're going to do the very best that we can. Uh, more of a different type of message for me to preach today. This is really not necessarily an evangelistic type which uh, when I'm preaching evangelistic messages, I, it feels like a shoe that fits. I, I just feel like that's uh, a main thing that God has called me to do. Today is instructional. Today is simply I'm going to tell you about the living word. The Bible tells us here numerous times throughout these first 18 verses that, the, the, that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then he goes ahead to talk about the creative powers of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he was involved with that. So again, uh, this might be a message that would be maybe best suited for a congregation where people were sitting there that were questioning the, the truth of God's Word and whether Jesus was truly the Son of God. And today I'll be preaching in that aspect to the choir. You all have no doubts about who Jesus is. You don't question that whatsoever. So I guess if I'm going to put it this way, I'm going to preach today the living word, and, and as you leave today, hopefully it will be more ingrained in you of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Let us pray. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We thank you for the day that you blessed us with. And Father, we thank you for each one who's here. For those that are not able to be with us today, some... Their families are sick and they need a touch from you today. And I pray that you continue to, to bless Wayne and their family and Wayne and Becky. And uh, I pray that their, their uh, temperatures and everything be real uh, better here real soon. I just continue to ask that you bless and be upon them. And Sharon, uh, both Sharon's that we're missing today and different ones that are uh, away from us and need a touch from you. We just, God, we just ask that you bless them. And uh, we pray, Father, for the Word of God. We ask it as it goes forth today, that the Holy Spirit would loosen my tongue and my thoughts, and I would say that which would be pleasing unto you. Now, Father, only you know the hearts of all of us in this place today. And I would just ask that if there's anyone here today who's never been saved, and maybe that what they need to hear is exactly who Jesus is according to the Scriptures, that you would allow their hearts and their ears to be open today and receive the Word of God 
And in turn, under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, the drawing of the Father, I pray that they would receive Christ as their Savior and that we would all make Him the Lord of our life. Now, for those of us who are here today, we've been saved, we don't question our salvation, I pray, Father, that you would strengthen us with this message today. Help us to be more resolved to, to understand that Jesus is God in the flesh. Now, have your will and your way in our service again today. We thank you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So where I want to start out is in verse number one here and, and verse number two. And again, there's numerous mentioning of this throughout the 18 verses. We know that it's found throughout other portions of God's word as well. But I want to prove to you today about the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many Old Testament stories that we can go to, and we've discussed this. You've heard me say it. We've talked about it in our uh, Wednesday night Bible studies and our uh, discussions. But we go to a lot of Old Testament stories, and we can read about where, uh, for, exa for example, Abraham and Sarah. Sarah's inside the tent there. She's uh, working in the house, you might say. Abraham's outside, and some men show up, and they proclaim to Abraham that he and Sarah at the advanced age that they are, are going to have a child. And of course, Abraham is unbelieving. Sarah kind of laughs. But anyway, it refers to one of them as being an angel of the Lord. And I believe, as in that instance, as well as Sodom and Gomorrah, when Lot and his family are rescued out, there are different places there where it says the angel of the Lord. I believe that that is the preexistent Jesus Christ. I believe that before he was born of the flesh in the little manger there in Bethlehem to Joseph and Mary, I believe that he was, he always has been, he always will be. Jesus said that he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Uh, just this last week, Beth asked me, uh, she had a question about the Greek alphabet. And she goes, I don't want you to quote it all, but I need the first few, and I forget what her reasoning was. <coughs> But Jesus said that he is the Alpha and the Omega. And that is the Greek alphabet. And it's Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, Theta, Iota, Kappa, Lambda, Mu, Nu, Xi, Omicron, Upsilon, Phi, Chi, Psi, and Omega. You started out at Alpha, which is A, and you end at the very last letter, which is Omega. He's the beginning, he's the end, he's everything in between. So I believe that he was pre-existent. Here's, I'm going to give you several verses today, and that's really going to be the main thing I'm going to do. I'm going to give you verses to prove these four points that I've got. First of all, Hebrews 13.8 simply says this, and it's a blessing to us every time we hear it. It says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He is the same as He has always been since before the foundation of the world. He is the same today. He is in total unison with the Father. He is God in the flesh. He has always been. He always will be. There, was, there has never been a moment in eternity past or eternity to come when Jesus has not been there. He has always been. These things can be mind-boggling if you allow them to be. You know how we get by with saying it with such confidence? It's called faith. Faith. There are things in God's Word I never will understand until I'm out of this body and I'm in heaven. And then it will all become very clear. Our faith will then have been made sight and we will understand things that we have never been able to grasp here. By the way, if it's any comfort, I think there's things in God's Word that He doesn't mean for us to have a grasp of. And then sometimes we have to mature in the Lord before He lets us see some things. But nevertheless, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 5 says this, let your conversation, and by the way, conversation means lifestyle. Let your, I'm gonna, and I'm going to read it that way, let your lifestyle be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. Listen, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. He will always be with you. He's always been with you. He will always be with you even into eternity. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Did you catch that? God the Father's words are being penned here. What does he say? Let us make man in our own image. 
You and I were made in the image of God. In the image of God made He each and every one of us. Uh, when we were in the womb, God knew how we were going to be birthed. He knew how the, what our little bodies were going to look like. Uh, we have different ones in this congregation right here. Every one of us are unique and different. And it's because God said to His Son, let us make man in our own image and also to the Holy Spirit. My wife has always had the best example that I've ever heard. And I, I feel like it's simple enough. If you will take liquid water, if you will take vapor, and I think ice, if that, those are three good. All three of those are the same thing, and yet they're different. That's the way the Trinity is. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost are all three in one. They're all God, and yet they are unique in their uh, perspective, in their job, if you will, in what that they do. God and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ, they spoke the world into existence. Actually, it says that God said, let there be light. Then he said, let us make man in our own image. And then we have where the Spirit of God becomes, uh, uh, this body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we have all three in one. Revelation 13, 8 says this, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, listen, slain from the foundation of the world. Now we said all of that, and the, the Lord Jesus is having John pinned here, that all people who will worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb of God. Now I'll tell you what I, I take that as. There is a verse of scripture that says this, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. I know you know people just like I do that feel like that if I don't get involved then none of this applies to me. It's kind of like they're in a gray area. It's like they never signed up for the game. That's the way they look at it. The Bible tells us that we are a creation of God. God said to Jesus, let us make man in our own image. And when we were born, uh, when we were conceived, if you will, we were given a soul and a spirit. And that soul and spirit is going to spend eternity somewhere. You don't have a choice of opting out of this. You can't just go into oblivion and not be involved. You're going to spend eternity by your faith in Jesus Christ in heaven, or if you're going to refuse and reject Him, you'll spend it in a place called hell. The Bible says that it's a lake of fire. It's a place where the, the thirst is not quenched. It's a place where the worm dieth not. According to the Word of God and the story of the rich man and Lazarus, it's a place where there is torture. There is no in-between place. For those, and I, I don't think we have anybody here that questions this, there is no in-between place where souls go and wait to be dismissed from there and taken somewhere else. The Bible says, and the, uh, the Apostle John, uh, Paul said, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, it talks about the lost being reserved in chains or reserved until the day of judgment. But nevertheless, it does not mean that they are in an in-between place. They will be judged for their rejection of God's good gift of salvation, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, it says that this man, he was slain from the foundation of the world. If you put that in the Greek, or yes, in the Greek, it means before the foundation of the world. Before any of this was formed, Jesus was on His way to Calvary. Jesus is the pre-existent Son of God. Titus, no, Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 4 says this, According as He hath chosen us in Him. Now, let me put it so you understand. God has chosen us in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. So God had a plan of salvation before before Moses was ever born, before Abraham was ever born, before the first rock was ever placed here, before any of this was here, God had a plan, way of salvation. And it says that He chose us to be in Jesus Christ. Now, some of you here, uh, you know enough about theology and the study of God's Word that there are people who believe that we are pre... Help me with my word. Predestined. 
And you all know how I believe on this. You are right to your opinion. If you disagree, that's fine. But there are people that believe before the foundation of the world that God said, I'm going to make sure Kevin's saved and Ralph is lost. I'm going to make sure that Robert is saved, but Beth is lost. See, I don't believe that. And I understand it's called the TULIP plan. They, the total depravity of man, and unlimited mercy and grace of God and the love. And I understand all that. I know where they come from and I see where they get that, but I don't agree with it. And uh, I believe, aren't they Calvinist? Yes. Isn't that a Calvinist that believes that? I believe it is. And so here's what I believe. I believe that before the foundation of the world, this is what God said. I will give man a free will. And man will have the choice of whether or not to trust my son's work on Calvary for their salvation. And if they do make that decision in the affirmative, they say yes to Jesus, I have chosen them in my son. Amen. That's the way I look at it. Yes. Amen. Uh, I fellowship with Calvinists. I have friends who are Calvinists. I have books in my library that are Calvinists. But when we come to that doctrine, we have to disagree, agree to disagree. We just have to go our separate ways. And by the way, some of the greatest preachers of the previous century were Calvinists. It's just that it, it wasn't always their main subject that they talked about. In fact, they're some Calvinists. You'll never know that they are because they just don't talk about it. But that's what they believe. So you're entitled to your opinion. I don't believe it's a deal breaker. See, I don't believe that I have to break fellowship with somebody because we disagree on that. Here's, let me, and maybe I'm getting away from my message, but you are used to that. You've had 10 years of me getting away from my message, all right? When somebody says the blood of Jesus has nothing to do with our salvation, that's a deal breaker. <laughs> when, the, when they say that you have to speak in tongues to go to heaven and the blood of Christ and salvation and faith means nothing, that's a deal breaker. Yeah. Yes. Anytime there's false doctrine involved, when you add grace, a grace plus anything, you're making a big mistake. You're adding to or taking away from the Word of God. And, you know, the thing that breaks my heart is that the multitude that are going to leave this life without Christ when it was so simple. When it was so simple. And you know what? I guess if I've got a lot of goals as a pastor here at Mount Olive Baptist Church, but I think when my day comes, whether it's through the rapture or death, or you all say it's time to move on, I want to be able to say I preached it as simple as I could. That even a child can understand how to be saved. I think that's a great goal to have. Yes. All right. Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2 says this. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, listen, promised before the world began. God had made a promise before the world began, and that promise involved His Son. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. So let me just put that in in, in plain English. What, what the, the apostle here is saying is, you all know you weren't saved by the offering that you give or by money that you give. It had nothing to do. You could not purchase it with money. And by the way, he said the vain tradition of your fathers where they took a little lamb and slew that little lamb. Uh, that, that doesn't work anymore. But he said... But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. we we'll read that last one again. Who, meaning Christ, verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest or known in these last days unto you. That just thrills my heart. It just thrills my heart that God had such a wonderful plan that His Son would come meek like a little lamb and that uh, He would be crucified on a cross and His blood would be shed and it would pay the price for your sin and for mine. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Anybody here listen to the radio broadcast this morning? Did you? My mom sent me a message as soon as it was over with. She said, I almost turned it off after your opening story. 
I'm going to tell you the opening story. Some years ago, this gentleman by the name of Joe Wagner sent this story into Reader's Digest. And he said, a few years ago, I was a judge at a stock competition where there's stock, livestock. And he said, one of the contestants was a little girl who had a baby lamb. And she came out and presented herself before the group. And bidding started on what somebody would give for this little lamb. And people start off at $5 a pound. And when they started, the little girl had tears running down her face, and she put her arm around that little lamb's neck. And pretty soon, the bidding kept going on and on, and finally it was $10 a pound, and she wrapped both arms around that little lamb's neck, and tears were just flowing. And finally, a local businessman, he just couldn't take it, and he said, I bid $1,000 for that little lamb. And the little girl just fell apart. He said, not only that, but he said, I'm going to donate that land back to that little girl. And the crowd cheered like crazy. Mr. Wagner says that sometime later, several months later, he was judging essay, essays by, that were written by little children. And all of a sudden, he came across this one that was written by a young girl that had been at a livestock auction and had auctioned off her little land. And he said, I began to read this little girl's story. And she said, the bidding started off at $5 a pound. And, and it, it got to me. And then there was $10 a pound. And, and she said, finally, a, a, a local businessman, he bid $1,000 for my little lamb. And not only that, when it was done, he donated it back to me. And she said, when we got home that afternoon, Daddy barbecued that little lamb. And it was delicious. <laughs> probably get phone calls on this one. I thought this was a family-friendly radio broadcast. <laughs> I told a lady at work, and she had tears running, and she went, I went from tears to laughter, just like that. <laughs> it was really delicious. Oh, uh, let's move on. So Jesus is pre-existent. Now the next thing I want to prove to you also in verse number one is that to the people that Jesus was around, he was not only strange, but he was very controversial. Let me give you a few verses here. It says in verse number one, at the very last phrase it says, and, he was, and the word was God. Now there wasn't any problem necessarily other than him being considered strange and odd and unusual in Mark chapter number 1 and verse 22, that all the people that were around, it says, were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. In other words, when he stood and, and delivered a message, I mean, he had authority, he had power. There was no doubt or questioning, and, and he never said things like Kevin Hilton does about, I'm not exactly sure about this. He was exactly sure about everything. Now, I mean this in a complimentary way. I'm not trying to, to be a smart aleck. Jesus was a know-it-all. Jesus knew it all. You know why? Because he was what he was preaching. Uh -huh. He was the living proof of what he was preaching. Uh -huh. But the people couldn't understand that. And he was very strange. He was very odd, very unique. In John, the third chapter, I quote this all the time. The Bible says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came unto Jesus by night and said unto him this, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher for, come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Did you notice what Nicodemus said? He had heard Jesus preach. He had heard others talk about Jesus' preaching. He referred to him as a rabbi. They could not grasp that he was any more than that. And then he said, no one can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. In other words, he believed that he had some unique connection with God, but no more than just a mortal man. So he was strange and unusual. Luke chapter 4 verse 36 says, And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, Listen, what a word is this. Isn't that unique how God put that? What a word is this. For with authority and power... He commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. 
These people were sitting there and they watched Jesus take maybe that little boy whose daddy brought him and he's foaming at the mouth and flopping around on the ground and Jesus called this evil spirits out of him, the unclean spirits. And the, the young boy sits up and he's clothed in his right mind, no longer foaming at the mouth, no longer flopping around on the ground. It says they were all amazed by that. They were confounded. They were like, you know, we've heard of magicians doing things and but we've never seen anything like this. But here's where he went from being strange to being controversial. Verse number one, the last phrase says, and the word was God. This is, where, this is what got him crucified. The Bible says in John 19, verse number seven, the Jews answered him, we have a law. And by our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Jesus in John 14, 9 said unto Philip, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Jesus said, Have I been so long with you, you, you still don't get it, you don't grasp it? I am the Father. It's just that I'm in a, of the flesh. That's where he became went from strange to controversial in that he claimed to be God. Now, in verse number 14, we're skipping down here after the talk about John the Baptist. Verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So what John is writing here is, he said, We beheld him, and the glory that was around the Lord Jesus Christ was just like the glory of the Father. In other words, His power, His authority, He was. <clears throat> he was God the Father. So I want you to know that He was God and He was man at the same time. There are some people that can get even past the fact that Jesus is... Uh, uh, is uh, Claiming to be the Son of God. They can get past that. But some people just cannot get it into their head how that He can be God and how He can be man at the same time. Well, my friend, that is the whole purpose of why God the Father sent Him to come in the flesh. He has flesh like you and I do. Wasn't it uh, Thomas that wasn't there with him? And Jesus came back the second time and said, Go ahead and touch me. A spirit does not have flesh. Like, is that what he said? Yeah. He said, Go ahead and touch me. And then it's, it was unusual because when he came out of the tomb, he told Mary, Don't touch me. Mm -hmm. It's because it was a different time. 1 John 1 1 says this. Now, this is 1 John 1 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. He was God, but you can handle him. He was man. 1 John 4, 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He's in the flesh, and yet he's the Savior of the world. He's God. Luke 24, 39 says this. Behold my hands and my feet. That it is I myself, handle me and see. This is what I was quoting all ago. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. He had just died on the cross, but he came back to life. Why? Because he's God. But he had flesh that you could handle. So, Jesus is pre-existent. Jesus was strange and unusual. And he went from that to being controversial because he claimed to be God. And then the scriptures prove that he is God and man at the same time. Here's where I'm going to close. Verse number 18, if you'll look at that with me. It says, no man hath seen God at any time. Well, Brother Kevin, I thought you just said, when Moses was on the mount getting the Ten Commandments, God spoke to him. <laughs> But as God turned to leave, he put his hand over Moses' face so that Moses couldn't see. Does it not say that he saw the hinder parts of him? Yeah. I think it says that. 
Moses came down off the mount and he had the Shekinah glory of God. He'd been in God's presence. That is the time. That's the issue. Man has never looked upon God in his state that we will see him in when we're in heaven. The reason we were able to look upon God is because God the Father sent His Son in the flesh. And we were able to look upon Him. By the way, it says we were able to handle Him and hold Him. But He is the declarer of God to man. In other words, the purpose of Jesus coming was to declare to you and I who God the Father is because we can't look upon Him. So God sent Him in the flesh, Jesus in the flesh, so we could listen to Him, so we could see Him. John 14, 7. Jesus said, If ye had known Me, ye should have known My Father also, and from henceforth, or from now on, ye know Him and have seen Him. That's what Jesus came to do, was to declare the Father to you and I. And He said, From henceforth, when you look at Me, you're looking at the Father. It's all very... Sometimes difficult to even grasp in our mind. Colossians 1.15 Referring to Jesus when it says who? He is the image of the invisible God. He is the vision image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature. He is the image of the invisible God. When we look at Jesus he said when you look at me you're seeing the Father. Now here's my last one. Hebrews chapter number 1 and verses 1 through 3 says, God, who at sundry times, and I looked up that word sundry, I have many times down through the years of my ministry, uh, unusual, different times, says, God, who at sundry times and in divers or different manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So here's what he's saying. Back in the Old Testament, God spoke to you and I, people of that day and time, through the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Oh, that's back to the preexistent Christ, isn't it? He formed the worlds with the Lord Jesus. Who being the brightness of his glory, Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, when he had died on the cross, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So here's, here's the whole thing in a nutshell. Before the foundation of the world, Christ was with the Father. The Son was with the Father. They formed a plan. They came up with a plan, for lack of a better term. How to save us from our sins. Before the foundation of the world, God said, I'm going to allow man to have a free will. He can make up his own mind. He can either receive me or he can reject me. Before the foundation of the world, God the Father and the Son made a plan that Jesus was going to be born of a little virgin girl, a little Jewish girl, and he was going to live 33 and a half years and not sin one time. And at the end of that 33 and a half years, he was going to be taken by cause of his own testimony that he was God, God's Son. Wicked man was going to take him and place him on a cross and crucify him there. And when his blood came out of his body, it was the redemption price for all of us who really were sinners. Yeah. Amen. God's going to give us a certain amount, a number of days. And at the end of our days, we will either die or be raptured if we're at the end of the church age. And there will come a day when we will stand in judgment before God. And if we have received Jesus as our Savior, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7 says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That means the, uh, the force of the government, the judgment of the government will be placed upon him. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Did you hear the second one? Counselor. If we have received Jesus as our Savior, we will stand with Him at judgment, and he, we will keep our mouth shut. And it would be the smartest thing we ever did. 
Amen. Let's let our lawyer do the talking. You know what he's going to say? Father, this one belongs to me. Yeah. Notice the forgiveness. Notice the shed blood that's covering their sins. This one belongs to me. You know what he will say? If we've done well, he will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. And then there will be those that will have rejected. And they'll be standing there without any help. Without any counselor. And Jesus said, and I believe it's Matthew the 7th chapter, if I'm not mistaken. He said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. For many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And he said, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. We've got some that are being ushered into the presence of God. We've got others that are being dismissed into the depths and the pit of hell. And it's because you and I had a free will, and we chose for him, or against him. Back in the 1990s, President Bill Clinton went to visit Israel. It cost the Israeli government millions of dollars and headaches to ensure that Bill Clinton was kept safe and that he had a good visit while he was there. He was welcomed by thousands. They cheered him. They loved him. When his visit was over with, he got on a plane and he flew back to the United States and never got a scratch. The Son of God, before the foundation of the world, was destined to come and to be born of a little virgin Israelite girl. And he came unto his own and his own received him not. I say all that to say this. The President of the United States was more safe in Israel than the God who made it. Right. Yep. And it's because of people rejecting Jesus Christ. Right. So I would like to ask you today, do you know Him as your Savior? If not, what is it that you're waiting for? Folks, if you haven't looked at 2020, we met and I were talking about it on the way here today, I said, you know, it kind of got to be just a little normal quint people were using about how bad 2020 was, but just think about it. Go back and look at all the horrible things that have happened this year. Mm -hmm. yeah. My sister was in human resources for many years, and she said, Kevin, I'm terrified of what our insurance is going to do next year because of what COVID did to us this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't think because we're going to 2021 that, well, we're just going to leave this behind. My whole point in saying that, folks, is the Scriptures teach us if nothing else, we ought to recognize we're in the last days. Yeah. Right. Amen. You don't have a lot more time to make up right. your mind. Yeah. So if you don't know Christ as Savior, today's the best day. The scripture says this is the day of salvation. He never promised you tomorrow, <coughs> next week, next year. But you have right now. So let's stand and have a verse of invitation. And whatever your need might be. If you have a burden on your heart, you know this altar is open. You can come and pray.
service tonight at 6.30. Uh, might let you know the Shoeys are at Farm Fest. That's where they're at today. Uh, I, I let them know that Beth was up there yesterday and they all made a point to run into one another. And I think that their water issues, they told me everything was taken care of, everything's back to normal. But hopefully they'll be back with us next week, but they are at Farm Fest today. Well, Junior Burr, if you would dismiss us, please.